Hey everyone, welcome back to OTD Military History. Today we are doing Archer Part 2. For those who saw Part 1, it was uh, amazing. Tons of info. Chris has probably one of the few people in the world who knows this much about it. Um, I, cannot say that. I can say that with confidence. Um, I learned about this thing from Chris. So uh, other than that, if you enjoy the work I'm doing with the channel and things like these live streams where I can bring you pretty much anything we want, right? Any sort of niche content, big, small, whatever, and you want to go on this stuff and, and help with the channel, uh, supporting through, through Patreon is greatly appreciated. Um, it would be very helpful to keep this stuff going and getting more of it, especially. Um, the more I can do with the channel, the the more I have through Patreon and all that stuff, we can do more um, because I have to do other things that, you know, take other time to take away from this stuff. So the more support I have through Patreon or YouTube channel memberships or, you know, um, super thanks, anything like that that you can support or through PayPal, I can link all that down below afterwards. Uh, but other than that, any support you can give will really, really be helpful to keep this stuff going. I'm uh, going to be a bit busy coming up in the next little bit. As a lot of you know, I'm leaving to go to Normandy. But after all that's done and wrapped up, I'm hoping to do more of this stuff. So any support you can give in that way would be uh, greatly appreciated. Uh, without further ado, though, we will bring Chris in, our resident archer experts <laughs> for the entire country, I guess. Um, yep, yep. Because <laughs> I don't know many people else doing anything with this. Uh, unfortunately, but uh, it's good for you. Uh, anyway, um, and before we start, uh, the book is linked down below. Uh, I'm sure some people bought it last time, but uh, if you haven't, you can check it out. The link, uh, same as, uh, there we go, uh, same as last time, so check that out. So uh, other than that, uh, I'm not sure what else to ask. Do <laughs> you just want to jump in or yeah, anything let's, else? Yeah, let's just jump in. Um, anything thank you for joining us. Pardon? Sorry, anything? Anything come up from last time? Anything brought up from last time or anything like that? Uh, some some things came up from last time that I've incorporated into into this talk. Um, oh, we'll see. I don't know how long it's going to be. It might only be 45 minutes, but that will That's give fine. people time back or it'll give us lots of time for questions. Uh, we'll just have to play it by ear. Okay. Sounds good. I will uh, get us going. Great. Okay. So um, welcome to The Archer Part 2. Uh, next slide. Or as I was calling Here's it. Heard. Or oh, which arch? To... Okay. Uh, oh, whoops. We both did it. There. Reverse thingy to Archer Boogaloo. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, that's that's even better. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So this is uh, just I was I was telling Brad just before we started. Uh, this is an archer at the National Military Museum in the Netherlands. In where was it? Soest, did you say? Uh, just outside Soest. Yeah. It's yeah. An old yeah. Air Force base, old Dutch yeah. Air Force base. And the, and you can see a maple leaf in red there. So this is a, an archer that's painted in the colors of First Canadian Infantry Division. It came over from Italy to the, uh, Northwest Europe in March, February, March, 1945. Um, and there's some really good photos in a Dutch archive showing all these uh, archers. Uh, and interestingly that they have names, whether it's girlfriends or wives or yeah, mistresses. other people, I don't know, <laughs> but uh, it's, inter it's interesting. So that's where this name Joan comes from on this archer. Very cool. Okay, so am I driving the presentation here? If you want to, yeah, it's up to you. Sure, okay, all right. So, uh, the story so far. So, in 1942, the Archer was designed as a backup for the M10. The, the plan that the British Army had was to buy the M10 from the Americans and then to um, refit it with the 17-pounder gun. Um, anyways, and the gun that was mounted in the Archer was facing backwards because it was on this small chassis. Um, but uh, by December 1943, uh, the British had experimented and succeeded in putting the 17 powder into the M10. So when in the following May, the Archer actually started production, it had already been considered, was already being considered obsolescent. And so there were not initially any plans to introduce it into service, but they thought maybe there'll be a need for it. Um, but as it turns out, they basically just didn't have enough M10s. Despite all the material advantages that the Western Allies had, uh, the tanks could not be everywhere. There were not enough M10s to say, give them to every anti-tank regiment. So in 1944, in November, the Archer went into service with the infantry divisions in Northwest Europe. Uh, we, there's also a limited deployment to Italy. As we talked about last week, there were like eight trial vehicles that showed up in September. And eventually, the total number um, in the theater was 40, which was basically just enough for um, two regiments to have some archers. 
Okay, so uh, we were talking about Operation Veritable last week, and we had to stop. So I thought we would pick up here. Um, so one second here while I get my notes. So we were looking at 51st Highland Division, which was operating in the southern area south of the forest uh, and sort of ending at Gough. Um, and I'll just give some, and we're going to be talking about some Canadian operations in the red, the area marked by the red square there. Um, but just to give you a little bit of catch up context, um, from when the operation began, uh, we Canadians started by operating in those flooded northern areas north of the forest on the major road. Uh, 15th Scottish Division and 43rd Wessex Division were sent towards Cleve, um, which you can see in sort of the upper center of the map. Uh, and 53rd Welsh Division was assigned to clear the forest. Um, and uh, 51st, sorry, 15th Division pushed forward to Cleve. Then General Horrocks has sort of famously made a mistake. He thought that Cleve had been cleared and he ordered 43rd Division forward as a breakthrough force, uh, only that hadn't actually happened yet but they managed to penetrate into Cleve and there was this battle overnight. There were a few ar archers actually in the city for that fighting. I okay. don't think that act, pardon? Oh, sorry, okay, yeah, just I didn't know that part, cool. Yeah, yeah. What, one of the things that I found is that often archers, because they were mobile, were assigned to different little mobile battle groups or, or brigade forces. They'd have a brigade of infantry, some tanks, some archers and so forth. Um, and so there were some archers there and, and that, that first fighting, but whether they operated as anti-tank guns is not clear. I think it's possible those crews may have just operated as infantry to like capture or deal with captured German soldiers, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, anyways, uh, then 15th Division sent a brigade column, which again included some archers southeast from Cleve, um, and but then they stall stalled out at Moyland Wood and we Canadians took over. And you probably remember if you've read a history book or paid attention to Brad's stream, whatever, Moreland Wood was a really tough, bitter battle. Um, archers were involved in sort of providing some fire support from the flanks, um, but they weren't majorly involved. I mean, in the middle of a forest is not where you're gonna to want to deploy your archers. Yeah, yeah. and sorry, just to stop, I just have actually a point I wanna bring up and a question leading to that. Sure. Is, so I've been to, to Moylan Wood. It's actually next to a golf course now. Um, yeah. But it is extremely hilly and still forested, very heavily forested. Um, so that means as things have been thinking about kind of the technical elements of this. Was the archer, I don't know if the right word is okay, but good? Could it handle more or less that type of difficult terrain, you know? Quite uh, hilly, yeah. up and down kind of thing. Was it, or it, was it not? It, I think it, I think it was pretty good at the rough go at rough going. Uh, no, like notably, it was better than the M10 because it was a lighter vehicle for the amount of space on its track. So it was reason it was pretty good at going over muddy ground. Um, I don't know how well it would have done it, like navigating through trees or you know, like knocking trees over or anything like that. Yeah, because uh, we just had a from James off the top is just asking about the amount of gears. And... Oh yeah, uh, five gears in in front uh, forward and only one in reverse. Sadly. Um, yeah. Because they were working with off-the-shelf components, basically. What they already had was uh, five forward, one reverse, which meant since the gun was facing backwards, uh, the speed that the archer could go in the direction the gun was facing was very slow. Yeah, which makes sense. Okay, yep, yeah, no, perfect. Awesome. Sure. Thanks. Okay, so um, so next slide. No, oh, sorry, that's me. I got okay, it. Sorry. Okay, we're so we're going. To, so we're now going looking at the Gox Kalkar Road area. So um, Luisendorf, which is in the northwest corner of our map, there is southwest of Moyland Wood. And this operation that we're going to be talking about with Fourth Brigade um, was somewhat delayed because of worries about uh, German fire coming from Moyland Wood to hit the flanks of the attack. Um, uh, but by the nineteenth, I guess things were well enough in hand, even though the the forest hadn't been like fully cleared uh, to make the attack, or sorry, uh, by 21st, I should say. No, 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 sorry, getting confused. Okay, 21st is when the world, we really finished off the fighting in Moreland Wood. Yeah. 19th is when this attack was launched. So this is involving 4th Brigade of 2nd Canadian Infantry Division, um, and they pushed from uh, southeast of Luisendorf there, further southeast, um, up fields, which were gently sloping and muddy, 
uh, towards the Gotch Kalkar Road. Um, now, they there was a this was uh, strategically uh, Operation Veritable per se was sort of sputtering out, and was it Kurar who was in charge? Um, wanted to start this new operation called Blockbuster, right? And the Gosh Kalkar Road there was uh, part of the start line for that operation. So they needed to capture that area, clear it off so that uh, the next operation preparations could begin. So as a result of that, there was a massive opening barrage to back 4th Brigade with five different divisions artillery participating. Um, and then the lead companies of the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry uh, and the Essex Scottish went forward in kangaroos, um, the armored personnel carriers, backed by tanks. Um, so the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry or the Rileys were on the left, uh, heading for the positions that they took in green there, and the Essex Scottish on the right, the blue circles. Um, so there was mud, there were mines, there were anti-tank guns, ref references 88s, I think 88s in fact, uh, a lot set up along the road, which took out quite a number of the kangaroos and the Sherman tanks. Uh, and the forward companies of the Rileys suffered many casualties, but they took their positions. Uh, and their commander, Lieutenant Colonel Dennis Whitaker, uh, set up his tactical headquarters in a two-story milk factory, which I believe we can see in the next slide. Yes. So these are some photographs which were taken by a Dutch tour guide on the... Uh, Left, there's the, the milk factory that served as the headquarters. Um, and on the right is the view, let me just switch back again. So with the, the headquarters is sort of in the center of the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry areas. And there's a um, a farm area, uh, so the, the east, the west, sorry, the easternmost farm area there uh, is the, the second photograph here is looking from the headquarters towards that place. Um, now I can't remember what my next slide is, my apologies here. Uh, right, okay, so, um, the Germans began, uh, which came from the 6th Parachute Division and 116th Panzer Division, they quickly began counterattacking, as per their doctrine, uh, using small groups of tanks and infantry. Uh, radio contact was temporarily lost with the Essex Scottish, but both regiments held their ground. Then at dusk, as was the typical thing for the, ar the armor, the Shermans withdrew from the front line for the night. Uh, and in the Riley area, they were relieved by the archers of C Troop, 18th Battery of the 2nd Canadian Anti-Tank Regiment, which moved up behind the milk factory. Uh, and this troop was commanded by a Lieutenant David Heaps. So this is, um, just as an aside, this is something I've seen a couple of times in studying the archer. Uh, it was standard practice for the tanks to withdraw at night into a lager, Leaguer, uh, because of the worry about, say, German infantry sneaking up with bazookas or whatever and knocking them out. Yep. However, because the anti-tank artillery were used to using towed guns, I think, uh, this is my read of things, they were used to being up with the infantry. And so even when they had archers, that was still the sort of the, the practice that they had. Yep, makes perfect sense to me. Right. So the Canadians expected that they were going to be good for the... Uh, uh, for the immediate evening uh, and that the Germans were going to counterattack in the next morning, but the Germans had made other plans um, because uh, the commander of 47th Panzer Corps, uh, General von Lutzwitz, had decided to launch a night attack. Because of the power of the Allied field artillery, they were taking so many casualties, knocked out tanks, uh, infantry, and so on, that he figured, okay, if we attack at night, it will blunt the effect of that artillery. We might actually have better pro uh, make better progress that way. Uh, so he sent several battalions of infantry, uh, 14 Panther tanks, so Mark IV tanks, and 14, 14 Jag Panther tank destroyers. Uh, and if we go to the next slide, uh, that's a Panther tank on the left, which has been knocked out. I believe this is actually uh, reputed to be a photograph from this Gosh Kalkar Road engagement. Um, mm. The Jag Panther on the right there, though, is from another location, but that just gives you an idea. The Jag Panther was not intended really for infantry support that was a you know was an anti-tank vehicle but the germans did not have that much armor anymore so they were just pressing them in where they could uh so these attacks begin on the infantry the canadian infantry positions at 20 hundred hours 8 p.m uh and the forward companies endured no less than eight counterattacks during the night um now the archers did not play a part in these uh actions even though now this is something i haven't been able to figure out 
Okay. On paper, the archers were equipped with two-inch mortars, and the, um, the like the diagrams for the stowage for the archer indicate that they were supposed to have illuminating flares, uh, okay. which you'd think maybe they could use in a situation like this. But right. from what I calculated, the distance from the milk factory to those forward barns, uh, sorry, barns, farm complexes would have been too far. Uh, in addition, I've also come across indications that the archers were equipped with high explosive rounds for the mortars instead. So it's not even clear if they actually had uh, night fighting, like flares for night fighting or not. Maybe they had a mix. I don't, unfortunately, I don't have any information there. Yeah, makes sense. Cool. In any case, uh, the Canadians were able to call on lots of field artillery support, and this was able to disrupt the attacks from the German tanks and their infantry. Uh, despite this, though, the Germans kept attacking. Uh, and that forward left position that I mentioned called Schwanenhof, that changed hands several times during the night. Um, so in the middle of the night, Lieutenant Colonel Whitaker decided he had to commit his men left out of battle. Um, and the regiment was able to hold firm from that. Uh, for the, anybody who doesn't know, the left out of battle element was a cadre of a regiment which was left out of battle so that if things went disastrously and the troops that were committed got wiped out, that the regiment could be reconstituted from that cadre. So, you know, this happens occasionally that the left out of Alamen are also sent in. And so it was really a, an all or nothing commitment. Um, so the Rileys hold on, but unfortunately the Essex Scottish get kind of overrun. Uh, they don't all get captured or anything. They manage to hide in locations and so on. But the again, uh, communication with the Essex Scottish is lost. So at 9.30 the next morning, uh, the Brigadier Cavaldu um, who uh, committed the Royal Regiment of Canada to recover those positions and with some tank support. And the battle rages there fiercely until the early afternoon. Uh, during that morning, the Germans continued to fire mortars at the Rileys and continuing to pressure B Company at Schwanenhof. Uh, and the archers give the infantry some support now that it's light by firing some high explosive rounds at enemy occupied buildings. So then at two o'clock, things get fiercer. Um, because the Germans decide to attack, launch an attack on the right flank, so switching from the left to the right, with the infantry and four Panthers or Yag Panthers. It's, it's not clear from the evidence. Also uh, backed by heavy barrage. Uh, at five minutes to two, the archers knocked out two of the vehicles, followed by another one shortly after. The fourth one withdrew and was shelled by artillery. Um, now, the metal citation, there's a Lieutenant Heaps get a medal, gets a medal citation for his actions this day. And regarding this particular part of the battle, it says that he personally went forward with two 17-pounder self-propelled anti-tank guns to engage the enemy tanks. Due to the excellent positions he selected, three enemy Panther tanks were destroyed with four rounds and the enemy immediately withdrew. However, we've also actually got two veteran accounts from what happened. Um, one of them was from uh, Major Louis or Louis Froggett, who's the commander of D Company of the Rileys. So he was on the right side of the HQ where the attack was due to come in. Quote, we could hear the Germans warming up their tanks in the woods about 800 yards out front. My company headquarters was in a farmhouse forward of the Gotch Kalkar Road, less than 100 yards to the right of Battalion HQ. The Germans had been shelling us very heavily, and from what I could judge, they were going to attack across the field towards our positions. I had a pretty good idea where the anti-tank guns should be decided should be cited to meet the attack. So I went over and talked to the anti-tank officer and I said, I want you over at D Company. He agreed and we cited his 17 pounder right in behind a little building. So that's what that's what um, Froggett wrote, uh, even though, you know, we actually we know this was an archer and not a towed gun. We were absolutely determined that the Germans would be destroyed by our 17 pounder, particularly if we could get them in enfilade, so attacking them from the side. Uh, we explained everything to everybody in the company that it was important to wait for the tanks to come in. No matter how close they came, nobody was to fire until our anti-tank gun fired. That is exactly what happened. The anti-tank gun opened up and it knocked out the tanks. One, two, three, four. The tanks fired up, that is caught on fire, and Germans were jumping out of them. They were frying on the hot metal. We knocked out all of their infantry too. If those tanks had gotten through D Company, they would have hit battalion headquarters and rolled up the battalion. They were stopped right in front of the milk factory, less than 100 yards away. Now, we also have the account of uh, a gunner, Les Goff, of Lipton, Saskatchewan. 
Now, that is a photograph of Les on the right. Sorry, on the left, I should say. Uh, he's the, the taller of the two men. He must have been over six feet. I'm not sure how tall. Yeah. Um, and yeah. on the right there, that is a photograph of some archers from the regiment after the war. Uh, so he was manning the gun of the first archer involved. Oh, Quote, okay. it was raining fine drizzle with poor visibility up to about four or 500 yards. Our tanks, so-called, took up a position at one end of this building, and as usual, we didn't know what was up ahead. We sat there for a while. Our three other SPs were located close by in a sort of stand to readiness situation, when suddenly we could make out the sound of motors to our front. We felt quite sure that they were German tanks, and we knew our infantry were somewhere in front of us. There were four of us in the turret. Sergeant Bob McGurr, Charlie Lawrence, our driver, the Spud Islander Gotel as the loader, and myself, the gun layer. Yeah, and uh, to note there that he refers to Gotel as a Spud Islander because the man was from PEI. Yeah. Yeah. Edward Island, for those who don't know, province of Canada. Yeah. Uh, we were all peering into the mist when suddenly they appeared. I remember seeing them come out towards us, abreast of each other, spaced out some. I would guess 50, maybe 100 yards apart. They were accompanied by some infantry following the tanks. The sergeant had to get out of our turret as there was not enough room when firing. So McGurr jumped out, shouting to me to take on the one on the left. Given a range by McGurr, I promptly lined it up. I saw my tracer homing in on the target. I knew I had connected. I saw three men leap from the tank. I don't know if they were infantry riding on top of the tank or the crewmen. If this was a Yag Panther, I'm told they had an escape hatch right behind the turret. McGurr is shouting that there's another one to the right of the one I just put out of action, and the loader, Gotel, is pointing and shouting. So help me, I could not pick it out, as there was considerable hedges. Time was the important factor, so I said to Gotel to take my place and I'll load, which we did in record time. I am now on the right hand of the breach, and the spud is in the firing seat. The gun is already loaded, and I'm holding another round in my arm, in my arms, head below the top of the turret. So he must have been crouching down. Yeah. McGurr is shouting, fire! There's a blast as Gotel fires. The gun recoils and ejects the spent cartridge, and I ram another shell into the breach, hunkered down, waiting for the next shot. Nothing happens. I look across the gun, and there's nobody in the layer seat. I had no idea where he was. Le this left me and Charlie Lawrence, the driver. The 88s were homing in on us, slamming into the brick building. Sergeant McGurr got hit by a piece of flying brick, so that put him out of action. Charlie says, let's get behind the building before we catch something. I agree, I agree with him, as there did not seem to be anything we could do. On rounding the building, we met up with some of the other gunners and machines. Our Lieutenant Dave Heaps was there, and according to all reports, we had successfully stalled and turned back a very determined counterattack of enemy tanks and infantry. Whew. So, um, that engagement done, though, the Germans were still not giving up. Uh, at 3.15, the infantry told Lieutenant Heaps that another tank had come up amongst those that had been knocked out previously, using them for cover. Lieutenant, quote, Lieutenant Heaps went forward to establish its position. He then directed his third gun to its fire position, fired two rounds which set the tank on fire, then quickly moved his own gun to a new covering position in time to prevent damage and casualties from shells fired by the enemy tank until its crew is forced to abandon it. So I have to assume then that they set it on fire but didn't knock it out instantly, so they had to maneuver so as to not get knocked out themselves. And then again at 6 p.m., the Germans launched another attack. Uh, by this point in time, Brigadier Cabaldu has sent forward uh, a reserve squadron of tanks and some Cameron Highlander infantry to reinforce the Rileys. And despite that, though, there's two hours more fighting than the Germans were beaten back. Uh, at 1600 hours, sorry, 1800 hours, uh, the same day, the enemy struck again, this time on the left flank of the position, employing strong forces of infantry and tanks. Lieutenant Heaps, in the face of the enemy and under heavy fire, personally directed two of his guns to their fire positions. Again, the enemy suffered heavily, losing three more tanks after being forced to withdraw their infantry with heavy casualties. Um, now, there's actually another medal citation. You know, there's an interesting question about when a citation is given to an officer, it's, it's not necessarily just the result of his actions, but also the, res the result of the actions of his men. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head whether this citation was for a medal awarded or proposed, but not actually awarded. 
but um, I came across one for a Lance Sergeant Walter Stanley Owen. Um, and it says in the citation that during the battle, he placed his archer in an advanced location where he was able to observe an enemy counterattack being launched on our positions. Regardless of intense enemy fire, he Im immediately recited his gun and knocked out three Panthers, which temporarily stopped the counterattack. So in total, C Troop knocked out six enemy uh, AFVs and disabled one more. And for his bravery and for the efforts of his troop, Lieutenant David Heaps was awarded the Military Cross. Wow. Uh, that's the, the map of the en engagement area again. Yeah, sorry, I just want to, if I can just jump in there real quick, Chris. Sure, also, Great to catch your breath. Um, yep, yep. This, obviously, those citations are pointing out, I mean, there's some contradictory stuff, but what, what else is new is Ian's. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but for those who don't know this area or haven't really seen it, I mean, the map can't really tell you how this area is completely flat and open. There is nothing to hide behind in this area at all, other than a few pockets of buildings and, and forests. So I just wanted to that add that in there that this putting these things in a forward position is going to take a little bit of bravery to do something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So that pretty much um, blunted the German attack, at least that day. And as we know, basically the Canadians were able to hold the line from that point and then eventually able to launch Operation Blockbuster. But that's a story for another day. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I thought I would um, jump ahead from this to talk about um, a battle that took place much closer to the end of the war. But the interesting thing is that it also involves 4th Brigade and the same troop of archers. Um, so we're going now to Groningen and the liberation of the Netherlands by the Canadian troops. Um, and Groningen is in the north of the country. Uh, I've put a red circle um, on, the, on the map on the left up near the top. That, that's where Groningen is. Um, now, let me just find my... Um, bear with me for a second here while I locate the right section of the manuscript. Yeah, yeah no worries. Right. Okay. So, um, just a little background for uh, the drive north. Uh, the night of the 7th of 8th of April, uh, about 700 French SAS soldiers are parachuted in ahead of the Canadians to seize bridges, sow confusion, and uh, raise local Dutch resistance. Um, Second Division continued a rapid advance towards the city of Groningen. Um, archers were supporting the infantry, knocking out machine gun nests and suspected German observation posts. Um, and uh, O Troop of 108th Battery, which was together with the Toronto Scottish Machine Gun Regiment, they were charged with protecting the left flank of the Canadian supply route. And the funny thing here is that so you can see the line that goes from uh, go, goes north up to Groningen, right? They got as far west from that position as me the town of Meppel or village, uh, which is the the red oval that I've marked about halfway up. And uh, the photograph on the right is one of a number I found in the Meppel archives. Um, so they were actually the Can the first liberating forces to enter Meppel uh, from the, the other the other route of advance. So they're just that protecting was... the flank, and that that's why they ended up. So far out? Yes. Okay. <laughs> that's a bit of a hike. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so now, uh, okay, so next slide there. Okay, so um, on the afternoon of the 13th of April, the lead elements of the 2nd Division reached the outskirts of the city. Now, the city was being defended by German soldiers from a variety of units, totaling about 7,000 men. Um, they didn't have tanks or many anti-tank guns, but they did have a lot of 20 millimeter anti-aircraft guns, which were very dangerous anti-personnel weapons. And a big complicating factor, unlike a lot of other urban warfare that took place in the Second World War, was that the civilian population, 150,000 people, had not been evacuated. So as a result, the Canadian commanders uh, um, issued the order that they weren't going to be using air power or any heavy artillery. And if they were going to be using any of the smaller field artillery, it had to be restricted to large targets like factories and parks. Hmm. So uh, the head of the column of Sorry, Chris, Brigade. I just to, yep, sorry, yep. I just want to jump in there again one more thing. Sorry. It's just because Groningen and all this stuff is still fresh in my mind from my trip. Yeah, sure. Is also Groningen has an element of Dutch SS. Yes. So they are literally fighting for their lives. They, they, you know, 
they're caught, they're dead. So that yeah. adds to the brutality of what happens in Grown Again. Sorry, I just yeah. want to get that out there. No, no, it's a very good point. Uh, pretty grim situation, really. Um, so the head of the 4th Brigade column, they're coming up from the south, um, sort of in the center of the map there. And it consists, again, of our friends, the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry, uh, Shermans of the Fort Garry Horse, uh, elements of the Toronto Scottish Regiment with heavy machine guns, or, media, well, machine guns anyways, uh, and the 2nd Canadian Anti-Tank Regiment, including some archers. Um, they captured a small bridge, and then just before a large city uh, park, there's an enormous concrete roadblock. Um, and now this is interesting. Uh, the archers tried to destroy the roadblock with their 17-pounder guns, and uh, I've read about the use of the 17-pounder guns a combi using a combination of armor-piercing and high explosive to knock out concrete, but this yeah. fails in this case. And from what I've read, most of the the um, roadblock was actually dismantled by a dismantled by a Sherman tank using a tow cable. Uh, and then from about 5 p.m. until midnight, there's a lot of fighting through the park between the Germans and Canadians until the Canadians get control of the park and the surrounding buildings. The next day, the 14th, uh, the 4th Brigade continues to advance north. And at this point, we've also got um, the other two brigades of the division coming in from the west and southwest. Um, from 10 until 3, the Rileys fought their way forward until they reached one of the bridges leading into the old city um, with a Dutch name that I hesitate to pronounce, uh, Indrachtsbrug. Um, they were then, all, then though, because there's, we've got Canadians coming from the south and also from the west, there was a worry about uh, friendly fire hitting each other. So they were ordered to hold their ground to avoid getting caught in any crossfire. Um, but while they're doing this, C Company is getting shot at by German machine guns from the other side of the bridge and by snipers. And basically, they're finding that if people move there, it's leading to casualties. So the captain of the regiment's anti-tank platoon, so that would have been with a six-pounder, he tries to knock out one sniper shooting at the buildings, but this fails. So he goes back to the regiment's tactical HQ to get some arbit support. Um, but in keeping with the theme uh, about the limited Despite all of our, the tanks, we had limited tank support. There were no tanks available at this time. And so uh, Colonel Whitaker re requests an archer from 2nd Anti-Tank Regiment. Mm. Um, so again, C Troop is coming up to help uh, with a fellow called Sar uh, Sergeant David Miller with his crew. Uh, quote, uh, in spite of the heavy and continuous fire directed at him, much of which was fired uh, from above at the open top of his vehicle, Sergeant Miller moved his gun about in the area, engaging enemy positions until all were silenced and the infantry enabled to consolidate its position." End quote. Um, so that day, the Canadians were able to seize some key bridges, which really compromised the position of the defenders. But like you were saying about the Dutch SS, the German commander refused to surrender. And so the battle continues street by street. Uh, by the end of the 15th, they only control a northeastern corner of the city, and then on the 16th, that gets captured as well. So, um, there's a photograph here uh, showing men and archer on parade. So this is um, turning in ceremony or parade uh, for this particular unit. Uh, the men here, are, you know, they're driving on parade before turning in their vehicles and. Uh, I guess eventually going home. But this brings us to the question of what happened to the archer at the end of the war. Um, so in general, um, the regiments in Northwest Europe uh, and in Italy turn in their archers and most of those are gonna be shipped back to the UK. Um, there are, um, before the end of the war actually, a few get shipped east to fight the Japanese um, and, oh, right. yeah, yeah. And, and, and some men train on them in, in India but they're not used in battle before the end of the war. So it's sort of to no point. Um, a few archers are given to the Dutch uh, mm -hmm. to rebuild their military, but after evaluating them, the Dutch decide not to put them into service. But that's where the archer in that museum, I believe, comes from. It's from the yeah. vehicles that were given to the Dutch military yeah. post-war. Makes that They did that with all kinds of kids, so, yep. Yeah, yeah. Right, so... Um, but the, but the archer continues to be used by the British Army. Um, so from 1945 until 1951, um, the Royal Artillery continues to have an anti-tank role. And so uh, these photos here are both uh, from Royal Artillery men. 
the photograph on the left there, uh, you can see a crossed keys emblem. That's the second division. Um, these men were posted to Germany, um, the garrison there. And the photograph on the right is from a, a training camp in Wales, um, mm -hmm. where these men are being instructed clearly on ammunition. Um, I won't get into sort of some of the, uh, what, what, what's the right word? Uh, bickering between the Royal <laughs> Artillery and the Royal Armored Corps um, right. about who should have control for uh, over anti-tank duties. But basically in 1950, I believe it was, it was decided that basically the, the Royal Artillery did not have enough, pers have enough personnel to supply men for anti-tank regiments and also uh, new regiments of field artillery and heavy mortars. So the so simply more or less reason, you know, effectively budgetary reasons, the the role of anti tank is given to the Royal Armored Corps instead. And so then the archers are actually transferred to the Royal Armored Corps, um, and they use them till about 1955. Uh, and aside from Germany, we see some archers being sent to Libya and to Hong Kong. Uh, actually, in Ho the Hong Kong detachment was sent in 1949, so before this transfer. Um, and then finally, in about 1955, uh, a bunch of archers get sold to Egypt and to other Middle Eastern countries. Uh, the Egyptians turn around and use the archers in Sinai during the 1956 Suez crisis fighting. Uh, and that's the last time I was able to find any evidence of them being used in battle. So we have to presume that most of those got scrapped uh, in various different Middle Eastern countries. Um, yeah, so that basically brings us to the end chronologically of the story of the archer. Um, now, uh, I'm happy to announce that I would like to give away a copy of my book to somebody watching this live stream, um, either now or in the immediate future. Um, so if you would like a copy of my book, uh, I'd like to ask you to please go to my website, alliedarmor.com, and on the books page at the bottom, you'll find a link uh, that will let you join my mailing list. And next Saturday, the 23rd, I'll do a, do a random draw from the people who are uh, have signed up to the list and send a copy of the book to whoever that is. And if by some chance you've actually already bought a copy of my book, uh, I will arrange something else for you. Um, I don't know if you can really see right now, but I'm wearing a shirt with a, an amusing image of an archer. Um, maybe we can get a shirt printed or some stickers printed for you instead. Uh, I'm still sort of fighting with Red, Redbubble about whether they will allow me to like, for the, the artwork to get approved for shirt printing. Oh, okay. Maybe you and I should talk about that after. Anyway. Sure. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so I've got a bunch of other stuff to talk about to do with the Archer, um, but uh, just to give people a minute, actually, this would be a good point. So give people a minute to, to write down the website URL. Uh, maybe we can handle a few questions at this point. Yeah, sorry. Uh, most of them have been answered, a lot of, a lot of tech. Um, mm -hmm. Are you gonna explain why the Archer is called the Archer in a slide or? Do yes. You do that? Okay. Uh, most of it's a lot, it's a lot of tech but that's being answered in the side chat. Lots of mm -hmm. calibers and types of ammunition, which I go, think go. we're yeah. good right at. Um, just had one. Actually, it's a good question. Uh, oh, things are, uh, da, 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 da. ah, here it is uh, for me. And are these, uh, post countries also who use the archer getting the Valentine? No, not that I've read. Um, the archer I think was appealing because the 17 pounder gun was still quite relevant in the mid fifties. Um, but what you would get out of an, uh, a Valentine tank at that point in time would be pretty minimal. I mean, it'd be yeah. better than nothing, but um, <laughs> not exactly up to snuff. Depending on what you're trying to do. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe you can answer this just real quick. It has been sure. discussed, but uh, mm -hmm. oh, I just lost it again. It might've been from Ian. Uh, it was around the discussion of uh, basically, oh no, it's from Terry here. Uh, about that roadblock and, and grown again about uh, how that high explosive may have performed mm. i guess generally speaking because you i know in other parts of your book you talk about it being used uh, against buildings against entrenched troops yeah um reasonably but i mean <laughs> another way to look at it would be say maybe not great um the uh, there's 
there's a number of different types of high explosive ammunition which get provided for the 17 pounder right. uh, and initially basically just like the explosive charge that could be fit into the shell initially was quite small so the, the 75 right. millimeter gun from the sherman was better um and then they managed to come up with i think it's super he or something like that they managed to come up with uh new varieties which have got more high explosive blasting content but i don't actually know if it ever reaches the same level as the 75 pounder um sorry sorry the 75 millimeter that, that the yeah. sherman had yeah makes sense um some of these questions were answered in the previous show mm -hmm. so sure. i want people to uh Go watch that. <laughs> Question about the crew yeah. versus the M10. We talked about that extensively. Yeah, this yeah. one I can answer. The answer is no. All the archers mm -hmm. are built in the UK. Uh, yeah. And some questions I don't want to pop up because I don't know what they mean and I don't want to put them on the screen and get demonetized. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's let's go on then, shall we? <laughs> yeah. Sounds good. Okay. So um, I wanted to do some myth busting. Uh, and for starters, I know we talked a little bit about the driver's seat last week, but I thought we would take uh, a closer look at that. Yeah, awesome. So, um, so uh, right. So, what we've the photograph, the, it's not the photograph. Sorry, the diagram on the right is showing the gun mounting for the 17 pounder uh, in the Archer. Uh, and what I want to draw your attention to is the rightmost side um, of the the mounting. There's this deflector plate. Um, that's supposed to catch, I believe, the empty shell cartridges once they're ejected from the gun. They hit that and then fall back down to the bag to catch them down below. Now, and the driver's uh, head is more or less right behind that, uh, <laughs> which is not, I mean, admittedly, still not encouraging. Um, no. But uh, I found the quote from related to 20th Anti-Tank Regiment. Um, about uh, about the issue of recoil, uh, and when when a, a survey went around to the different anti tank regiments about equipment and so on. Uh, so quote, uh, so in late 1944, 20th anti tank regiment quote were about to receive their first Valentines, as in Valentine SPs, that is archers, and they had sent several NCOs, non commissioned officers, and drivers on courses. They seemed to have some rather unfortunate impressions, which were mostly incorrect. A driver said there was very little room between the breech and his head. It was pointed out to him that there was a deflector guard in between the breech and his head. And should the breech come further back than this during recoil, it would mean that something had broken or come adrift. And he would be in trouble, even if he was another couple of feet away from the gun. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And so now, uh, to just to, uh, give another view of that, uh, this is this uh, cross-sectional diagram of the archer. And you, I've, I've labeled in red there where the deflector guard is and where the driver's seat is. Sorry, I just the, I think that's so funny of stop complaining. You'd get hit with it by anyway, so I'll just deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so now I mentioned we, we looked at um, Archer's paint, like the Archer in the in the museum, which was painted in the first Canadian anti tank regiment colors, right? Yeah. Um, and I wanted to go over a bit that was, uh, I think I referenced last time, which was that this regiment actually received some archers with a, a dangerous de uh, recoil defect. Mm -hmm. um, they, didn't get the, they didn't get their archers until very late, 10th of April, 1945. Uh, and then they went to zero the archer's guns. That is going to a firing range and firing a bunch of shots to make sure, sure making adjustments to make sure that the guns were aiming where they were intended to be, you know, the shots were landing where they're intended to. Uh, then they discovered that 16 of these 18 uh, archers, the gun recoiled 14 and a half inches instead of the usual 11. Uh, and this was just just to uh, to put that in perspective. If the gun recoiled another half inch, it would hit the deflector guard. Um, so there's clearly something wrong. And so then they launch a long investigation. Well, not a long investigation, but quite a bit of paperwork about yeah. what was going on. And eventually they find out that there's a, a some sort of difference in a, a groove in one of the in the in the hydraulic recoil buffers that you know catch mm -hmm. the recoil from the gun and prevent the breach from going back any further. Uh, and so then they do a swap of a uh, a buffer from a working gun into one of the faulty guns, and lo and behold, it doesn't work. Um, oh, 
And so uh, basically they were instructed not to fire these guns unless it was an emergency. Fortunately, 1st Canadian Anti-Tank Regiment never actually saw action with their archers, so they never had to fire them. But this just went to show that like, even before getting into action, the guns were tested, um, and if there was a fault, it would get found. Yep. So um, second myth is that the archer was made out of surplus Valentine tanks. Uh, I'm here to assure you that no, this is not the case. Um, if you wanted to get technical and look at numbers, you could say that like, I mean, yes, the, the archer hauls a little bit longer than a Valentine tank. Uh, it also didn't have as much armor. Even the belly armor, I went and checked this, uh, the belly armor of a Valentine tank was 20 millimeters. Belly armor of an archer is 10 millimeters. So like, there's no, it wouldn't have met, well, it would have exceeded the specs. But anyways, uh, they were not built from surplus tanks. Uh, this photograph that we've got here shows archers being produced in the factory in Newcastle. Yep. Not much more to say there. So now we get to the question of the name, because there is a story that is, been shared around that the name Archer was made up after the war. Right. Uh, and now this is there is, on the other hand, for the M10, there's a, it does get referred to as a Wolverine. And I don't think anybody has been able to trace where this name comes from. But it, right. so far as I know, does not come up in any Second World War documentation. Um, but so the supposition then is Archer is the same thing. Um, but that's not true. Uh, to give a little bit of context about where the name came from, uh, we've got three different organizations that are involved in the process of ordering and producing armored vehicles in the UK. We've got the War Office in charge of the Army, uh, the Ministry of Supply, and the manufacturers. The Ministry of Supply sat between the War Office and the manufacturers. It was made up of both military personnel and people taken from the manufacturing side, uh, and they were responsible for talk, you know, liaising with the manufacturers and so on. Um, and, uh, in a, uh, sorry, it, it, the name for the archer, as I'll explain, comes from the Ministry of Supply, but actually it was not the first name that was proposed for the vehicle. So I found this in documentation related to the Sexton, uh, which was a Canadian made self-propelled, uh, field gun. You can see a Sexton on the right hand side there. Uh, and so in this 1943 memo, you can see. Uh, the 105 millimeter American vehicle that's on the left there is called a priest. It did retain, it did use that name. Uh, in the middle, we've got a so-called bishop. So that was a Valentine tank where they actually did just take off the turret, stick a box on top with a 25 pounder gun and call it a day. Um, and then we've got vicar for the 17 pounder Valentine, the, the archer, and curate for the, the M10. And vicar and curate were never used. Yeah. Uh, so what we've got here is that there was a naming system initially for all these different uh, artillery vehicles that were based on different types of priests. Um, and, but in 1944, in September, uh, this is the first time I found reference to the archer as a name, and it all it indicates a change from this priest-based naming scheme to an a, a a naming scheme based on everything starting with the letter A. Um, so we've got Archer uh, for um, the Valentine with the 17 pounder that we've been talking about. Uh, the Avenger, uh, this was a, in the first talk, I talked about how everybody wanted a Cromwell tank with a 17 pounder gun, or rather a, a Cromwell based yeah. self propelled gun. Yeah. That was the Avenger. That's a photograph of the Avenger you can see below. Uh, but very few of those were produced. Uh, and I don't believe any of them saw action in the Second World War. Uh, and then in this same memo, we've also got Electo. But mm -hmm. if anybody has looked into that vehicle, it's a it's a funny little thing. It eventually was renamed Alecto. Uh, and even into the 1960s, when the British artillery get a new self-propelled artillery piece, it's called the Abbott. So again, a, the A names carry on even in even past uh, the the wartime period. And connection to the religious thing as well. What? what that, sorry, I got to ask. What does what does Harry Hopkins have to do with anything here? Uh oh, sorry. The there was a, a British light tank that was named in honor of Harry Hopkins. Uh, okay. It was never put into production, but then this Electo was based on the Harry Hopkins chassis. <laughs> of course it was. Going, uh, we, we're going very deep into the weeds I, here. Okay, I have so many questions about why, but I mean, 
I guess, because they was it British? Yeah, so it was British picked because he helped. Yes, make it was a, more wanting to help Britain. I mean, I don't. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so random. Yeah. Sorry, that's a complete uh, rabbit hole there. But uh, <laughs> indeed, indeed. Yeah, for okay. people who don't know, Harry Hopkins was a non-elected. I don't know, right hand man to Roosevelt. It's mm -hmm. hard to say. Basically, was his chief of staff, but he did way more than that. Uh, right. Anyway, he, he liaised when you know with all kinds of people and did all kinds of stuff. And yeah, yeah. Basically, FDR's right hand man who did lots to help Britain get support from the U.S. Uh, early in the war. Anyway, yeah, yeah that's so random. Uh, anyway, yeah. <laughs> right. Okay, so um, I thought it would get a little bit technical for a little bit here and talk about some problems and solutions that were found uh, for the archer. This is just getting, scratching the surface in a way. Um, okay. and, and basically what we're looking at here are sort of design oversights. Um, okay. So the first thing is machine guns. Um, the archer was provided with just a brand light machine gun and two stens. Uh, and basically that was just for crew defense and you know, the I don't think what was anticipated is that they wouldn't really be using these from the vehicle per se. Or maybe they yeah. would, but hopefully, you know, not very much. Yeah, but I, there was lots of evidence. I found it in multiple uh, regimental war diaries that experimenting with trying to mount a bigger gun, a bigger machine gun on their archers. Um, hmm. uh, now, I don't have any evidence that any of them succeeded except for 3rd Canadian Anti-Tank Regiment. So go us again. Um, <laughs> So this is an archer coming off of, um, I think it's a raft uh, from 3rd Canadian Anti-Tank Regiment. And I hope you can see the box-like structure and the barrel with sort of little, <laughs> it's got a kind of a cir circle patterned surface to it, It's a, which is a 30 caliber Browning machine gun mounted on the front of the vehicle there. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, so 3rd Canadian Anti-Tank Regiment did experiment with this and actually put them on it. Um, and odd little connection. You can read about this in the book. This particular archer, based on the serial number there, the S279 blah, 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 uh, was the archer of a fellow called a Sergeant Darrow Gomez. Um, and in the Battle of Emmerich, um, he earned a DCM for actions against anti-tank vehicles and German infantry, including the use of the machine gun that they'd mounted on their vehicle. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, just a bizarre coincidence that his his vehicle happened to get photographed. Um, so uh, next though, we're gonna be looking at basically issues to do with the op open topped nature of the vehicle. Um, you know, look, the, back in Normandy, uh, the Royal Artillery hadn't anticipated the degree of danger from mortar fire. And that was part of what led to the introduction of the Archer because the Archer could drive away more quickly if somebody uh, if a gun crew was being shelled at. Yeah. Um, but the Archer itself was open topped as well because they wanted, when they designed the vehicle 1942, they were really looking at, we want all round visibility so that we can see the enemy tanks before they yeah. see us and so forth. Right. Um, so um, this led to demands for a roof. Um, and I got something I wanted to talk about here, but I think we'll have to, Skip it. So anyway, sorry. There's a lot of there's basically a lot of demand from different regiments for roofs, um, and there's an interesting report which you can see in my book again about how when gun crews had a towed gun and they were fired out by mortars, basically, uh, and some of them took casualties. It was sort of seen as like, well, you know, there's no escaping it in a way. But once you had an open-topped armored vehicle the crews could see like, well, you could mount a roof on this, so why don't we mount a roof on this, right? And so it becomes justified that like, once, you st once you're actually going to the, to the step of actually providing a vehicle, um, you should do what you can with the vehicle and not just provide the same protection that the, the towed gun crew has. Mm, right. uh, so now uh, on the right there, we've got a photograph from a vehicle of 20th Anti-Tank Regiment they had had M10s before, and they right. put roofs on those. And this is a photograph of a, a roof that they cobbled together for one of their archers. Uh, I'm not clear on whether or not it was successful or not. What it's, what it's got is it's got a post at either, either side of the fighting compartment. And then I believe um, sort of 
uh, folding f pieces of metal that are folded down towards either side of uh, the fighting compartment, so the forward and the back. But then there's a hole cut out for the commander to be able to like peek over the top and and uh, see forward. <laughs> it somehow um, seems worse than open top for some reason. <laughs> there, there were even concerns from some officials who saw it. There were even concerns that this thing is going to give them a false sense of security. Yeah. Please put some cross braces on this to so that it will hold up under anything more than light shrapnel. Um, yeah. Anyways, a uh, photograph on the right shows an official pattern roof that was actually manufactured. Uh, okay. They took a while, unfortunately, to get started on actually making these. It seemed initially like some of the reports from Normandy are like, well, you know, they would like a roof, but, you know, Normandy was special, more or less. And so, like, let's hold off on and see whether we really need to spend the money on this. Um, but uh, anyways, this was the, the roof pattern that was finally uh, constructed. It looks quite thick, but actually there's two layers of metal um and a, a sort of a hollow space in between and you can't see in this photograph but there's part there's an area that's somewhat scooped out underneath to give the crews a little bit more headroom uh unfortunately these were not ready before ve day uh there's a document talking about how these are going to get shipped out to regiments and it's dated ve day um so it's just a bit of bitter irony there because it didn't arrive in time to do any good um, and then uh, there's another aspect to the vehicle being uh, vulnerable, although the crew would be less concerned about this than about them getting hit, and that is with regards to these engine louvers. So the, the, black, the black bars that you see in the photograph on the, right, the left there are either um, intakes, those are the ones on the right, or uh, outlet for air uh, for the engine, to make sure to keep sucking in cool air and to get the hot air out of the engine compartment to keep it from overheating. And since there's a gap there, that means shrapnel can go down from mortars or from airburst uh, artillery rounds can go down there and hit the engine and knock it out. Um, so uh, in Italy, uh, because it's so far away from the UK in terms of supply, uh, local engineering a local engineering establishment attempted to make uh their own alteration to provide some protection so what they did was uh in an, in the normal engine louvers i think this is for the outlets because uh, you can see a handle in this diagram on the right which would correspond with these handles uh it's hard to explain but those louvers are part of like the doors for the engine compartment that you open up and i think that in the original all of those uh, those gaps, like the, the metal slats are all in parallel. And what they did was they changed those from being in parallel to being this sort of L-shaped cross-section so that any bit of metal that was coming down was going to hit one of the bars and so it would just get stuck or hit that and, and lose momentum and so no damage would come to the engine. Uh, ironically, though, once the officials in, in uh, the UK heard about this, they said, uh, stop installing these in archers, please, because we're working on an official solution and we don't want to have two different solutions uh, operating in theater, uh, which is, you know, really official dumb. That's all I can really say. Uh, what was eventually produced in the UK is shown here. Um, so you can see what, what they produced then, you can see in the photograph on the right, is these metal plates with either some slats or holes cut out of them to allow some air to escape, um, but these could be put down when the archer was parked, basically, on top of the louvers and provide some additional protection. Uh, initially, they were completely blocked off, and if the archer tried to drive like that, it would overheat, so then they went through some experimentation. Uh, and so uh, when I was researching the archer to begin with, I saw archers that looked like this one on the right from the post-war era, and I thought it was additional armor protection that was right. added to the vehicle. But yeah. that, as I did my research, it turns out that this is what they were. Huh. Interesting. So um, that ends uh, the talk I prepared for today. Uh, but maybe we could field some more questions. Yeah. Well, that was awesome, Chris. Thanks for, uh, especially at the end there, digging into um, some of those myths. That's really, really interesting. Uh, sorry, just one second here. I just want to go back sure. up here. Yeah. Um, so we got lots of good chat going on the sidebar today, which is Love it. Uh, amazing. Uh, and again, some of them are answered in the first show. So <laughs> go watch that. Um, yes, 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. And here's there's an interesting one for for me and about the, the, the Harry Hopkins, which just started off a whole debate or discussion in the sidebar, which is pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so there's one at one at Bobbington, which is interesting. I mean, it's not surprising they have all kinds of weird uh, weird yeah. things there, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that's pretty cool. Even an archer. Yeah. Yeah. They do. Um, I mean, we could. We talked about this at length, I know, in the first show, but maybe just for those who haven't watched it yet, we can do a quick, why not just the M10? Right. Um, Keep it quick, maybe the, the elevator version. <laughs> the, the, the elevator version was like, they were worried about supply of M10s. Was the U.S. going to be able to actually produce enough that the British could get all that they wanted? Yeah, yeah pretty much. Uh, so just uh yeah oh well no there was some question about the the the, the Bessa machine gun but we know that was not used in, in right. the archer i don't know it would even fit anywhere um uh oh well, actually i don't remember when it was asked but someone asked if probably i don't know if you've ever come across something like this but if captured mm -hmm. german machine guns were ever used with an archer no i have not come across that um there is a there is an interesting little question about like where did the different regiments get machine guns from to try and mount them on their archers. And yeah. when, I, when I looked at the third Canadian example there, I thought, oh, they got it from the M10. But on checking that, the M10 had the 50 caliber. So where they got a 30 caliber from, I'm not sure. Half track, maybe. Yeah, maybe. I don't know, digging on half track, yeah. Um, yeah, sorry. Oh, and then just a quick one. I, I can't remember, to be honest. Is it uh, diesel it engines? Diesel? diesel? Yeah, diesel. Yeah. That's what I thought so. Sorry, there's lots of discussion about Harry Hopkins in the sidebar. That's all right. Cool yes. <laughs> the, 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 engines, the engines were produced in Detroit. Right. Yes, that's right. We did talk about that in the first one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I'm just trying to see if I missed anything. Yeah, so if anybody has any questions, uh, now is a great time for that. I just want to see if I missed anything here. We got talk of 17 pounders and then Harry Hopkins. It's hard to parcel out what's going on here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, about the hatches, which is interesting. Um, yeah, oh, there it is. It was from here we are about the captured. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. One. Yeah, I don't think that's anything. I've missed anything else. Um, it's interesting. I've I've read about the use of captured German machine guns, but there was yeah. one worry, which is that like if you fired them, the your other allies might think that you were a German, right? Yeah, they're gonna shoot at you. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Um, I don't know if we talked about this in the last one, but when did the mm. Valentine production stop? Right. So Canadian Valentine production stops in, I believe, April 1943. Uh, and, okay. and the um, British decided before that that they're not going to produce the Archer in Canada, which has been discussed. Yep. And then uh, a lot of the Valentine production gets curtailed at that same time except in Newcastle. And then, so there's just one factory that keeps producing Valentines until March. Well, I don't actually know if they continued producing, were able to keep producing Valentines right until March, 1944. Um, yeah. But into the, into the first quarter and then the changeover to produce archers was apparently pretty quick. Um, makes sense. But yeah, it's the one factory that changed over from Valentines to archers. Yeah, that makes sense given the, overall coordination yeah. of um yeah they need the same supply of art uh engines tracks all these components they were just gonna have to put them into a new hull and then get the 17 pounders and so yeah. forth i can't remember if we talked about this in the first one if not if I, we did i apologize but sure the americans right m10 we get it um was there ever anything uh, maybe uh, this is the nerdy archival historian in me <laughs> any doc any documentation of, of americans maybe even just poking around the archer thinking, oh, man, check it out, anything like that, or any, maybe even anybody else might have been looking around the thing or asking interesting, questions. But no, I have not come across. It, it would be interesting to see what exactly the American anti-tank forces thought of the archer. They'd probably hate it. Um, in oh, fact, yeah. I, I'm, sure, I'm sure that they would have loathed it and said very nasty things about it because the Americans were very focused on high speed uh, anti-tank uh, vehicles, that's true. Uh, and the Archer is not that. Yeah, sorry, I'm just reading. Um, yeah, 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 that makes perfect sense given the um, what they're trying to do anyway. <laughs> it doesn't, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, 
Yeah. Okay. So this is something I don't, this is not, this is really kind of off topic, but the Valentine DD, for those who don't know, DD stands for duplex drive. It's yep. the swimming tanks um, that were mostly Germans were used in combat. Um, I'm actually working on a video about those right now that I want to finish mm -hmm. sometime soon. Uh, does that, is there any discussion around possibly doing that with the archer? Or are they way past that at this point? Or uh, uh, kind of the second part of the question is kind of, same sort of idea is the factory talking about this stuff because i'm sure you got some records from them or they there's mm. something from the factory so in actual fact the valent so not i would say to ian that not only were dd valentine dds used close to d-day they were used up to close to d-day and it was oh. only not long before d-day uh that the sherman dd gets supplied to the regiments if yep. timing had worked out differently I speculate like maybe we would have landed with Valentine's, which wouldn't have been anywhere near as good. Um, yeah, uh, but DD per se, no. I mean, that, that involves a much larger, more extensive, you know, um, extension around the vehicle in order to, to make it float. Uh, yeah. And there, I did not find any evidence of DD archers being considered. And I think that's pretty, I'm pretty you know, certain that there weren't. Uh, there were, however, uh, required standards for waiting because in, in the case yeah. they had to do an amphibious landing with archers, uh, they wouldn't they wouldn't be deployed uh, as DD tanks, but, you know, brought in on, on a landing craft and then dropped off at the shore, close to the shore, and the, yeah. the Valentine would need to be able to wade to a certain degree. Um, so yeah, they did do experimentation in Devon with like uh, metal stacks that would stick up from the exhaust, the air intakes, and extra canvas around the top of the the fighting compartment, and so on, to prevent water from getting in while the archer was waiting. Yeah, that, that makes sense. The only reason I ask is because the archer was sent east um, uh, towards the end of the war, as we talked about, and and, and mm -hmm. some thought to have been used for some of the landings in, in in Burma, but it didn't quite work out that way. So that was only really the uh, yeah. Oh, right. plus you know I'm DD obsessed and the Valentine's funny story. So <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. No, there's a funny. I, actually, I, I glossed over a little bit about uh, the name for the archer. Uh, yeah. I, I found a record in. So there's a. The, there was a waterproofing committee that was in control of making sure that all the vehicles were properly tested and everything for waterproofing or arranging those tests. And so from May 1945, there's a minute in which there is a, this quote, the chairman called attention to the fact that certain code names used by the Ministry of Supply, such as Archer and Avenger, were not approved by the War Office and the Colonel of General Staff Weapons had emphasized that they should not be used in the Army. Oh, Jesus. It's <laughs> the most British or anything I've ever heard in my life. Look at matters at that point. Uh, right. Yeah, that, uh, I don't know what to say about that. That doesn't surprise me in the slightest. Committees were brutal for these kinds of things in the war, especially towards the end. Everyone's fighting about everything. Yeah. Anyway, I think we're caught up on all our questions here. Um, so thanks again, Chris, for coming on, doing part two. Um, Thank you very much. And thanks to everybody for joining us. Yeah. So everyone check out the, uh, I'll link some stuff down below as well for the book stuff. You can buy the book as well. If you don't want to wait for the draw, <laughs> uh, that's already all linked down below as is the Patreon. If you are willing to support the channel or through YouTube channel, uh, uh, yeah, YouTube channel membership. That's greatly appreciated. Um, and yeah, everyone's loving it. Uh, oh, that's the wrong one here. Susan is uh, oh. loving her, your imitation of, of the British. Um, I'm, I'm just glad I didn't try to do a British accent. Yeah, that was probably best. That would, wouldn't have gone well. Yeah. Uh, other than that, yes, yeah, being a great nerdy presentation. Yeah, this is really pushing the limits <laughs> of my, uh, my uh, nerdy tech stuff. That's really yeah, all I yeah. know. We have a question about Medi about how the archers were deployed. If you don't know that, go parch part one right now, <laughs> where we talk about that extensively. Uh, yeah, so other than that, thanks again, Chris. Uh, tomorrow, I have Dave Patterson coming on to uh, talk about the taking of the channel ports. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, that's going to be a good one. Um, it's an underserved area. I'm sure I've talked to you about that. Um, understudied area of First Canadian Army, uh, and just an interesting uh, battle. And there's a uh, piece from Project 44, who those know them. 
uh, of Boulogne, uh, the taking of Boulogne. That's all mapped out, and I helped with the writing on that one. So, yeah, so hopefully Dave has got his all the work done so we can get that one off tomorrow. Uh, other than that, um, yeah, thanks, everyone, for hanging out. Thanks again, Chris, for uh, bringing uh, all your archer knowledge to us, and we already talked about what you're doing next, so uh, I guess we'll have to bring you on to do M10 at some point. because uh, That'd be great. I definitely have some questions about the end myself and then I'll, I'm sure you'll be able to answer them anyway. But uh, other than that, I will see uh, everyone tomorrow. Have a good rest of your Saturday, everybody.